Okay. Ik dacht ik ga naar Tony. Het is still morning. So good morning. Ni still ana ko kani to kimi am tutu am skapi pikani, which means my Indian name, my native name is Lone Camper, and I am from the South Pagan, which you know as Blackfeet. We're the only band and tribe that's in the United States. Our other three sister tribes were separated from us when they made the infamous 48th parallel, better known as the the, the Canadian border. So our families were literally split, and we're the only ones in Montana. So um, therefore, we became the Blackfeet of Montana, but the whole confederacy is called Blackfoot. So I guess up there they have one foot, down here we have two. <laughs> native nutrition is really important to us as, as Native people, of course, and it has been since time immemorial, as you've heard earlier. I appreciate the opportunity and thank you very much for letting, allowing me to be here. Mindy and everybody that was instrumental in this, great job, this is awesome. And thank you to uh, the CARE program, MSU Bozeman, and also our booth out there, Turtle Island Tales, a little plug. Native nutrition is, is, like I said, really important to us as Native people. Where I come from in the North Country, we're, we're the original inventors of the paleo diet. So we're going to talk a little bit more about the meats and the um, passing on knowledge of traditional food preparation. These three photographs here represent things that are still going on today. The one on my left and your, I believe it's your left or your right, with a large group of people is what we call the Okan or the Medicine Lodge. The Medicine Lodge is done every year and it has been for centuries and centuries, a long, long time. And this, this particular one was just last year. During the Ukan, we have people that help us prepare the food. It's all involved with plants and, of course, the, the, um, the seeds is very, very important because we also have tobacco seeds. That's the indigenous tobacco. It's not the carcinogenic, cancer-causing tobacco that is on the market today. Um, very important ceremony. The tobacco ceremonies are, are still going on today in Montana as well as in our band. In the middle photograph, is one of our young, very young um, people. In this photo, particular photograph, Tiki Sum, better known as White Moon, or my granddaughter Cami, is only five years old. She's being transferred the knowledge of the Chickadee Society. The Chickadee Society is the youngest society in our, our um, ways of knowing, and they begin um, as Chickadees in training where they become the helpers, they do little um, things like their own dances, they have their own paint, they have their own society gatherings, and uh, they represent themselves very well. It is also um, transitional, because once she turns 13, she will transition out of this society and become a grandparent. So somebody talked about elders yesterday. The United States government and the greater societies don't know what eldership is because She'll only be 13 and she'll be an elder th to this society here. Passing on this knowledge is really important because um, when they start learning at that age, they learn how to prepare the food, they learn how to distribute the food, they also learn, learn the value of making foods happen in uh, these ceremonies, and they have their own little traditional um, feed at their gathering. Plus, it's really an honor to be blessed by a Nipomakik with their little shawls because they dance like little, little chickadees. And then when they come around to greet you, it's an honor to be blessed by them. On the other side, my husband is teaching our grandson um, to be able to build a fire, and of course, we're in a, in a wooded area, so things were kind of touchy. So we're very happy to be able to share these with these processes with you. In five years ago, the Inni, which we call the buffalo, you heard somebody, uh, I bet, believe it was Kayan, talk about how we all pronounce buffalo in our languages. Inni for us is the real food. And for us, the, in this particular uh, group of buffalo or herd came back from Elk Island. So we call this the Elk Island food. Um, and when this happened, we waited patiently for them to return from Canada, Elk Island, Alberta. They left our area uh, nearly 150 years ago. I made a big circle to the west and up north and then back around and came back to the nor Northern Plains area, uh, specifically our reservation near the Rocky Mountains, the foothills of um, Glacier. 
in this particular time we were waiting for them and it was so heartfelt and it was also very emotional because um, it's like bringing home your babies again and the babies that, that came home came home with, with um, I believe 98 two, two perished on the way on the truck drive and it took all night for them to want to get out of the truck and come into the corral where they were but we all waited for them and it was a great big homecoming for this, this beautiful animal now that they're there, we have the seasonal rounds again, which we do. And thank you to the gentleman that had the, the 13 moons because that is very enlightening and it also is very encouraging as we do the same. So in the wintertime, these, these particular one, uh, ones are behind my house, not too far away. But then there's a process here that we started. During the pandemic, we couldn't get together too often, but we tried our, our best. So we had the buffalo there, of course, and there wasn't very much gathering. So it was done mostly in small groups. So in this particular scene, you see the, the buffalo in the winter, how they migrate. We have them in different pastures on the reservation. In 19, the 1980s, my husband was responsible for writing one of the proposals for the Intertribal Bison Cooperative. And since then, it's grown to 27 more tribes in the USA. And it's very profitable. It's very enlightening. It's also very heartwarming to have our, our buffalo come back to our people. So in this particular photo on my left, I am teaching the youngsters here that day to cut dried meat. And they're doing a very good, very good job at it. In the middle photo, we have each year now, since the bison are returning, we call it INI, the INI initiative. And in this particular INI initiative last summer, there was a full bison that was harvested it was video, there's a bison movie coming out on this, but the youngsters got involved in it and they got to experience what we did in the, since time immemorial, be able to butcher the buffalo, to harvest it, to know what parts are usable, edible, which is everything. We use everything inside and out from head to toe, tail, everything for, for different traditions. On the far right, you see another one of my granddaughters that we're teaching different traditions and she's holding what we call the buffalo stone or the inniskim. Now those that have the buffalo stone or the inniskim in our traditions, um, it is said you never go hungry. And that goes back, way back when our people were starving. We had the starvation winter of 1883-84 and there were over 500 people who perished there because the buffalo were, were literally being eradicated and you all know that story. So the inniskim came to one of the women and she was crying, she wanted to feed her babies. So she asked for prayers and she was concentrating. She heard this chirping and this noise and it was this buffalo stone talking to her. Now all of you that know this, the seeds and the, the babies that we nurture, how those things can talk to you. And even in this day and age, 2022, we have these things happen. These particular things will chirp. Mine chirps like a bird and it's really, you're kind of confused and thinking, is this stone really talking to me? But they say if you have that in your cupboard, you will always have plenty of food. So the buffalo stone is really important. We're teaching our children how to gather them and harvest them. This particular um, slide shows the, the ladies that we, the young ladies that we were teaching, were doing different types of things at the table. Um, of course, they have aprons on like grandma. And then we proceeded to cut the dried meat. So they, we couldn't be in two big groups at the time. They're preparing the dried meat. I am teaching them and showing them because it's really important. That's high in protein. There's more things that come just from the dried meat, how it was prepared, how it was packaged, how it was preserved, how we transported it. And as a paleo people and, and the indigenous people, how we preserved it. So we're teaching them these things today. And this particular slide shows the men are in the back. So we had gotten the bison, the buffalo. They're grinding hamburger and they're making other meat cuts just like we did in the old days. But nowadays we have uh, a few other little tools that we use, namely the sharp steel knives and uh, then the, the ability to dry inside and outside, okay? So this is the learning process that's very important to us and we still do this today. In the old days, of course, we gathered berries and there's been a lot of berries that have been exchanged with different tribes. Here in this area, the berries are very important. I see that. We have berries for breakfast, berries for lunch. We have berry soup. We have berry sauce. We have pies and, and whatnot. But the little old lady here is 
Long ago, the berries were gathered and dried on a buffalo hide in the sun, much like you would do the cranberries or even the raisins and stored in, in, in pouches of um, rawhide or else what we call the sitsuyat, it's a suitcase and preserved with a, a plant, okay? We also have the wild strawberry in our area that you see on the bottom, along with the, the, what we call oak and oak, or the savis berry. Some people call it service berry. Some call it june berry. But this is very important for us. It's what Creator gave us with all the nutrients, the reservatrols, the A to Z vitamins, and a fruit, and also sweet for us. On the other far right, on the red, is a currant. The, the currant berry is important. There's stories of, in our creation about the bullberry that is very bitter and there's a silly story that, that I won't take the time to tell you now because it'll take up all my time but the um, uh, old man that helped our, in our creation hit the berry bush because he couldn't get the berries off of there and nowadays that's what we do because there's a lot of thorns on there so the berries fall onto the, onto the robe or the, the blanket on the bottom and nowadays we use canvas and therefore we found out a better way to harvest rather than to pick them and get all the burrs in your hands or scratched. On the very bottom is elderberry. Elderberry is making its way back into our communities. We have what we call the community gardens, the tea gardens. You heard a little bit of um, Kay talk about those. And our association with the fast Blackfeet, the, the community gardens are, are doing elderberry, savisberry, sage, uh, I believe there's seven of those, and we're teaching people along with them to grow them, harvest them, and handcraft them, and, and market them sometime. In the middle, this is one of my children. This is a, this, this lady that's picking berries here did a 12-hour shift. She's a nurse, but as soon as we brought her home and we brought her up to the berry patch, she says, I'm going picking berries. So that's, that's what we've done is, is teach our children this particular knowledge because it's very important. For without this berry, we cannot have ceremony. Without this berry, we do not have um, a feast or a feed. The soup is very important from this berry, so we have taught our children this knowledge, and it continues today. This is a close-up of that beautiful berry and our, the way we harvest, uh, of course, by hand. A uh, Lots of um, fun is had, lots of stories are told, and in, in this particular photo, uh, my husband's hands are pretty purple, and usually it's, it's the whole family gets involved in picking berries, and that's very important. Just recently, a, um, a program that was started at MSU Bozeman under the CARE program is called Turtle Island Tales, and I'm the grandmother to Igmo, that little bobcat there. It's um, kind of something to get used to because usually I talk to humans, but this guy is a little bobcat that I teach uh, lessons and stories, and here... Uh, we are doing berry soup and showing Igmo the process of making berry soup, which is, again, a learning situation for children. Nutritional value for food, being able to teach the younger ones that it's important. Long ago, what the old people would do, and we still do this today, is we would take the mixture of the berries, the sweet and the sour, and make what we call a pacifier. And they would suck on that without getting the seeds in there, including the rose hips, which has all that vitamin C in there. And the little ones would do the, the, get the juice out of there and suck on them. On the bottom, it shows a very good berry patch. At the bottom, middle, my husband and I are, are in there. And all these photos will tell stories. In this particular one, my brother was, was um, welcoming his first grandson into the world. So all the teachings that we have also go with what knowledge we carry as a legacy in our families. Biscuit root. Sicily, Indian paintbrush, and on the far bottom went, went by my fingers is what we call Pitsisawa. You have that in this area as well. It is, all these are medicinals for us, and during the pandemic, several of these were very important. I made gallons and gallons and gallons of, of the herb, herbal teas for people who had the COVID, and these are the only things that gave them relief. So we're very proud of that. In the middle is, is the youngster again. I believe she was three or four here, teaching her how to gather the grasses and the, and the herbs in the fields at the time. The other, the other important part of this is all of these are wild. They're growing out in, in the wild at the foothills of the Rockies or in fields. One of the problems we're having 
is people are starting to learn these and they're coming in with backhoes, with uh, trucks, and just scooping these up and putting them in the back of their, their trucks and driving off with them. That just doesn't work. Because for one, you're ruin ruining that natural flora and fauna. The other is, yeah, you're gonna have a little bit of sweet grass or, or maybe a, a sweet Sicily or a anise plant for a while, but what are you gonna do with the rest of it? So we, we've made strides to enact some legislation on the tribal level to protect our herbs, our gathering areas, and also the, um, I guess, our, what you call the wild harvesting process. Gathering and preparing has really been a very, I guess, fun time, and it's also seasonal. And that's why I appreciate the moon calendar and the seasonal rounds, because once you start gathering these, you know, have to know when, how, and, and um, how long, and how to preserve them as well. These particular pe pictures show the gathering of what we call the mint. In our, in our language, we, that we have several mints, but you know that the mint plant is square, right? All the other ones have a round. I see a lady saying, yeah, she knows. The mint plant is square. There are several species of the mint plant, but this one is particular to our area. And I mentioned earlier about preservation. There's 101 uses for mint. You have mint toothpaste, you have mint mouthwash, you have mint gum, you have tummy mint tea. Well, this is the original one that Creator gave us in our area, and how we, how we gather it is really important. It's, it's uh, long stemmed, long rooted, and it goes into sequential order, to much like the sage. So if you pick that all out, you're almost depleting that. So we make sure that we, we cut the stems. My sister has one fingernail, she calls it danger. So she's all, you wanna use danger, I'll, I'll clip your plant for you. But sometimes we get a little wiser and we do, we'll use a, a fingernail or a, somebody else's scissors if they have them. So there's gardening scissors now available now, but long ago, we just knew how to pluck them. And then the time to gather is in the early stages of that plant development. Because once it flowers, the flower um, signals to you that all the nutrients have risen to the top, and now that it's time for it to go back down into the root, and it will go back into bed and asleep like a good little baby. So this is a particular, a really important time for us, and I believe this is uh, just about the beginning of July. But with climate change and all this other stuff going on, we're getting a little bit of, of, of a difference. I've noticed this year the plants, especially in our area, are dwarfed because we've had spring, then winter, spring, then winter, and then a lot of them have been frostbitten. So they're trying to grow, but um, the sun and the, the, I guess, the Rocky Mountain front snowstorms are still kind of having wreaking havoc on us. In the other part there, uh, my little sister is holding up her harvest. Um, I tried to get the car out of there, but I don't, I don't know how to do um, Photoshop. I had to have my granddaughter help me with this PowerPoint, so I didn't quite get to that one. Um, the other photograph on the bottom is our grandchildren are helping me harvest the plant. So we, after we harvest it, we dry it in a certain method, hang it, and then take all the leaves off the stems and store it. So this is what we're doing. Talk about a nice, fresh smell. How many of you like the smell of mint? It gives you a, a fresh feeling. It makes you feel uplifted and whatnot. So when we're doing harvesting the mint, drying it and preparing it and then storing it, the whole house, the, the teepees or whatever are filled with this aroma. And it is very, very good. For storage and sharing, Again, I mentioned that storage and sharing long ago was in what we had from the land, from the plants, and from the animals. So we had the rawhide cases, we had the rawhide um, cylinders as you know them. Also we had animals, so if there was an unborn fawn that was gotten, we dried it, prepared it, and made that into a bag for berries, or even the herbs that we gathered, and that was very good for storage. Nowadays we have what we call Mason jars, Ziploc bags, refrigerators, and even sometimes um, microwaves. But I've never put a herb in a microwave because I don't believe in changing that, that energy of that plant to um, let the microwave destroy that. Thank you. On my 
right, on my left, sorry, are two Olivias. And I met an Olivia last night, Olivia Davis. This is my sister, Olivia Davis, and my granddaughter, Olivia, rides at the door. And they are helping us do storage and sharing on this day. So they both have an apron on, and they're both what we call servers. And they would be able to know exactly what we needed at what time in the ceremony. And one is teaching the other. Unfortunately, Olivia, Auntie Olivia went on to um, the other side in 2017. Now this young Olivia is carrying on our traditions, and she'll be a freshman in high school next year. Thank you. On the other photograph there, this is a really a great photograph to show you what went on during the pandemic. I teach classes in nursing, in foods and nutrition, in pharmaceuticals, but I couldn't do it during the pandemic, so it was all done on Zoom. You can't have people taste your plants in Zoom. You can't have them smell it. So this was really a challenge for me, but I took this picture to share it with you because all of my plants their herbs and even the ones that we had dried are pictured here to show you the example of what we went through. So all in all, it was a good experience, but we're still doing what we need to do. It's, it's how it is. And um, I guess in this day and age, there's a reason for everything. Significant expressive teaching is really important. And that's what we're, we're talking about today is passing on this knowledge. You see myself here with several items that we use to instruct the students. Our lodge is very unique. How it's, how it's set up always faces east. How it's painted, how the design is, what's in the middle of it, how you're seated in there, who sits where, who knows how to do this, how many poles do you use? Those poles are plants. That is the lodgepole pine. The other plants that are on here are the savisberry uh, stems or choke cherry to hold it together like the buttons on your coat and then on the, the pegs on the bottom after uh, so many years into the centuries after the lodges came we start using the what we call the pickets or the the pins to put in the ground and that is from the hardwood of birch or the hardwood of savisbury because once they're dried they're very hard and sturdy so we teach them, the younger ones, with this little small model. Also, it's a math lesson. You start with an odd number, or even number, you end with an odd number on this lodge. So 18-foot teepee has 21 poles. So they learn that as they're going. They also learn to gather them, to cut them, to peel them, and learn um, that sometimes it really tastes good if you just kind of put your tongue on it after you peel it. So they learn a little bit of sweetness there our natural sugars. And then we use other tools. There's an eagle in there that, that we did not just go harvest. It took us seven years to get this eagle head from Fish and Game out of Denver. The other significant expressive teachings in the middle. This was a class project for our, our younger students. I believe they're in the fourth grade. They were told to do a village or a, a um, maybe a medicine lodge camp. And this youngster a granddaughter of mine made little teepees out of eight inch round paper plates. And then she just went on our own. We went outside in the middle of the winter and gathered little sticks and plants that had uh, been buried under the snow. And she comes up with all this. It's a little village and each one of those little lodges have a little tea light in there. So that was her fireplace. So it, it, it was a learning experience as well for her, but it also gives her the chance to know that our lodges always face east, and when we gather food, it's a seasonal round. And then on the other photo, she is, of course, learning to hunt. And that is a, a really a big coup for a lot of our children. They have forgotten to use the bow and arrow, of course, but they now use, they start out with a BB gun, and then a 22, a 22 250. And I'm kind of getting up there in, in um, numbers. But then the other day, she's only 12. She asked her papa, when do I get to shoot the 350? I said, no, you're not going to do a 30 yacht 6 Not yet. <laughs> It'll knock you over. But these are the things that we're teaching them expressively. Teaching them by learning, getting out in the open. There was another lady I talked to earlier about going outside and teaching your students. I call it OBE. Out of building experience. And with that, I just have to do some expression here on the first picture that came up with my grandmother, teacher of mine, 
lived with me for years. She passed away at 114 in 1990. And that's her picture there on the side of the building. Uh, one of our younger nephews did a diorama of her on the side of the, one of the buildings at home. And next to her is her daughter, her last surviving daughter, my last aunt on my mother's side. She's 98 and she's still spry and she's still going for it. So I had to share this with you because those are who taught me. Those are the ones that, that found that it was important to pass this knowledge on in a good way. The other photograph in the middle is love, inspire, and teach, because that's what we do. We love each other. We love our parents. We love our children. Some of us don't have parents anymore. Some of us don't have ancestors anymore, but they are here with us in spirit. They are behind you 100%. So we teach them that as well, the importance of water, the importance of wind, the importance of fire, the importance of air, and the importance of the ground. I love people who play in the dirt. Making mud pies was not just making mud pies when we were kids. We put little plants in there. Sometimes a dandelion would grow, but we got something out of it. On the other is, of course, on the bottom is my Aunt Gertie with my mother. My mother I had to put in here because she passed in, during the pandemic, and she was 85. And to me, she's standing right here beside me now. She was a plant lady. She played in the dirt all the time and was highly criticized for for uh, always talking about her plants, but that's one of my teachers as well. On the other side, the far right, are three generations of us gathering berries in the fall. And these berries are what we call gupsi berries. You know them as dogwood berries, but they were one of the first berries that we used. It's called famine food. So when the starvation winters came, and what now when the buffalo were leaving, we could suck on those berries and get some nutrients out of them. And they leave a very fine little seed, and that seed becomes a bead or a decoration, and people would use those to make accessories. On the very bottom is my granddaughter and I um, on that same day when we explored the rivers on um, October 2020, before everything hit. Nitsi kosi nidaki means I thank you from the bottom of my heart very much. Gitsi kakomim, that means I love you. So I think I have two minutes left. I believe there's time for two one-minute questions and 35 seconds. Thank you so very much. So we have some time for questions here. But I thought I'd recognize you from the videos. <laughs> yes, those are so cute. Have you seen the videos? Igmu? Yeah, Igmu. That's so, so cute. You have, to, you have to share that with your family. Please look that up. And I, I thought I'd recognize you as grandma. Oh, <laughs> yeah. That's good. That, that, that's fine. That is such um, creativity there. Thank you. Yeah, with Igmu. Um, but I also um, um, loved how you shared that you've never put herb, herbs in the microwave. Yes. And I think, you know, in our generation here in this time, we want to instapot everything. Mm -hmm. And Instapot slow food, Instapot our slow cook uh, stews, and yeah. Chef Brian Yazi is always reminding us, like, whatever's meant to be cooked slow, slowly for six to eight hours, you can't put it in Instapot. Yeah. So don't be Instapotting for Instagram, okay? <laughs> <laughs> okay, let's jump to the question here. Um, what resources are there to learn the traditional methods of food preparation for those of us who don't live near our reservations or don't know anyone with the traditional knowledge to teach us? Me. Oh, just kidding. Um, yeah, you can. You can email us. You can call us. We would be happy to converse with you. There are other, I believe there's websites like in Digi Kitchens. There are the Igmo TP Dreams, where you can get uh, information there for recipes, as well as, as uh, listings of where you can find these plants. But there are not any resources out there like books and whatnot. There are very few that are written from the inside looking out. Most of them are written from the outside looking in, where they just surmise what, us, what the native people um, have available. So anybody with traditional knowledge in your area may or may not be a grandmother or a grandparent, like I mentioned earlier. But if you have the need, please feel free to reach out. My uh, email and addresses are in the program there.
Thank you for that. Can you tell us more about the Bison movie coming out soon? I believe that is uh, the follow-up will be held this year at the end of June. Uh, it's, there's a Netflix one that's coming out. McDonald Productions, Ivan and Ivy McDonald are, are doing that, as, as well as a, there's a movie called Suyi, and the director of Suyi is also the director of this movie coming out soon. I don't have the information, but we can get it for you. Mm -hmm. Any more questions for our dear Darnell? Okay. Well, thank you very much You're for very being welcome. here. So powerful. Yeah, thank, thank you. you.